Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen on the interwebs. My name is James Mura, and welcome to the James Mura Little Literary live stream. I'm really excited. Today, we've got some, some good, good guests who will be... <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe we need, <laughs> we need to introduce ourselves. <laughs> go right ahead, you start. We've been chatting about identity and the writer. And I'm just going to do a quick introduction of okay. them. Please introduce themselves, um, starting with Sharon and then Joyce. Okay. We can hear you again, I think. Okay, the internet has decided that I'm not going to have any joy. Um, but let's try this again. Ladies, um, perhaps you introduce yourselves. Um, we we'll start with Sharon. Tell us a little, a little bit about yourself, you know, the work you've done. Sure. Uh, you know, and uh, then we we'll go to Joyce. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, in I'm in Berlin, so it's evening over here. Um, my name is Sharon Dodwa Otu. I'm actually a, a British writer um, who's living in Berlin. Actually, I now have the German citizenship, so I should introduce myself as British German. And I was born and raised in England, in London. Um, both my parents come from Ghana. I studied German while I was living in England, and then I moved to Germany um, for the last time in 2006. I've been living here ever since, and recently uh, started to write in the German language. My first, my first uh, novel, my first full-length novel is written in German, and it just was published at the end of February. It's called Adas Raum. It will be translated into English as Ada's Realm. And I'm also an activist. I'm also very active in um, particular two organizations here. One of them is called the Initiative Black People in Germany, Initiative Schwarzmensch in Deutschland. And the other one is called Adifra, um, which is um, a queer feminist organization for the African diaspora in Germany too. Thank you, Sharon. Joyce? Yeah, so good morning. No, good afternoon, <laughs> everybody. It's afternoon because today I'm in Manhattan. I don't usually live here, but that's where I happen to be today. Um, so what do I do? I am a consultant who basically works in the realm of culture to help create those conditions that artists and art needs to thrive. Yeah. And what it means is that I do a variety of things. So I do academic research, which I publish in academic forums and the usual conference circuit, um, the usual, you know, chairing of panels, keynote addresses, and so on. All that goes with academia, a couple of lectures here and there. I don't lecture formally at any academic institution, which gives me the freedom to actually say what I think. Um, so it's very free. The other thing I do is, and the reason why I left academia was precisely to bridge between the academy and the public. And so I use a variety of platforms really to take the art to the people that it's about, including the artists themselves. And so sometimes I'll be publishing feature articles, reviewing books, talking about writers in the mainstream media. I use social media a lot, actually just specifically Twitter um, to kind of spark conversation and get ideas and just you know find out what people are reading and tell them also what I'm reading. And that's an interesting forum. There's what I'm doing today. Um, but I also do the kind of research, uh, what you might call action research. So for example, in 2019, I teamed up with my partners at Century Media to uh, do some research for the Gote Institute on gaming in Eastern Africa. And this is important because we can talk about the traditional arts, but we must also pay attention to the new spaces of creativity that are emerging. So who are the gamers in East Africa? What kind of games do they play, but also what kind of games do they make? Um, I do a lot of pro bono work with writers, reviewing manuscripts. And that, we'll talk about that because it's really about the condition of the arts in, in Kenya that puts me in this situation where uh, I do so much pro bono work, reviewing manuscripts, um, you know, trying to help people get in touch with agents. Uh, and some of the manuscripts are absolutely fascinating. But the other great thing I do, which I really enjoy, is a lot of memory work, writing about institutions and their past, but specifically sometimes um, being a ghostwriter, helping people tell their stories as biographies. And it's a lot of fun being a ghost, I can tell you. 
I mean, one of the things I love about work, both of you is, um, I mean, Joyce, you've not actually told us the two books you have written. I mean, uh, Kenya at 50 was one of the breakthrough through uh, publication, you know, telling us about, you know, Kenya, what Ke Kenya has been looking like for the last uh, 50 years. And that was during the 50th anniversary of, of independence. And then your, your new publication is 10 Cities, you know, where you talk about clubbing in Nairobi, Cairo, Kiev, Johannesburg, Naples, Berlin. Um, do, you, do you want to speak a little bit about those two publications? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the exciting thing about Kenya at 50, again, you know, having walked away from academia is that it allowed me to do a couple of unconventional things research-wise, which was um, not just looking at the intersection between politics and culture, but using a blend of narrative forms from the academic essay to the kind of personal biographical essay. It was, I was very inspired by James Baldwin and just emerging, immersing yourself in the in the world that you live in and talking about it authoritatively using methods um, that are discernible. Yeah, so that was very exciting. And I really just wanted to look at, so for example, you'll find a, up to that point, you'd have found a lot written about um, the politics of Kenya as far as the 1982 coup was concerned. But nobody was talking about with the coup, what did the social cultural dynamic of the country look like? Or specifically the, a town like Nairobi, which was having its first experience of a curfew since colonial times. So I was interested in those cultural dynamics of political movements. And that was a lot of fun doing that. Um, I was very lucky because leading up to the writing of that book, I had been um, writing opinion pieces and a couple of feature pieces for the Daily Nation. And that gave me a voice that was, yes, authoritative, but also not so academic as to put people to sleep. So really learning how to write um, for people, to people, instead of <laughs> preaching to the choir in the academy. That was fun. And and I think that the fortunate thing also was that I had the support of the Gota Institute. So it allowed me to stop doing everything else and just sit and write. Um, Ten Cities was also that kind of venture, uh, but even more exciting because what Ten Cities did was that it brought together writers, uh, you know, from journalists to academics in 10 different cities, five in Europe and five in Africa. And you know, just the seminars we had to discuss what we wanted to do in telling the history of popular music and of clubs in these 10 cities between 1960 and as far as we could go, well, it ended up stretching all the way to March last year, just because it was a difficult book to write. It was a difficult book to edit. It, and, and it was many voices and trying to allow each one of them to be as distinct as the cities they represent are. We had a total of 25 writers, so you can imagine. Wow. Um, <laughs> And credit to my colleagues, Johannes um, and Florian, they did just so much work, uh, including the work of, of translation from German to English um, mm. and, and then coordinating, of course, with the publishers in Berlin and so on. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, I have to say while I'm on the subject that I've been lucky enough again to get an opportunity um, through uh, a German connection to spend a year next year writing a book that I've been thinking about for the last five years. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. Thank you. Um, uh, Sharon, and yourself, you also you didn't talk about, you know, you talked about your first, uh, your current new book. Yes. Uh, Adas Raum. I hope I pronounced that okay. But you, you haven't talked about your other books. You know, no. synchronicity, <laughs> synchronicity, you know, the yes. things I'm thinking while smiling politely. I mean, do you want to tell us a little bit about those? Because I'm sure they build into the current book. Of course, I am happy to do that. The first two books that I published were published in English first and then translated into German. And all of these publications appeared in a very small um, left-wing publishing cooperative called Edition Assemblage. So that was already kind of unusual because this publishing press wasn't known to be um, publishers that dealt with uh, fiction writing. It was usually like non-fiction political pamphlets and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I already knew when I began writing that it would be very difficult for me to find a publisher for my work. A, because I live in Germany and I'm writing in English, and B, because at the time when I was first writing, I didn't know of... It's really hard to find black authors in Germany writing uh, from here, from this perspective, I mean, writing in English from the German context, it's actually really, it's really hard to find these people um, who are published, I mean, by big publishers. So I looked to just try to find a way to publish 
through my uh, network and contacts. Yeah, and I have I can hold I can hold the books up. I have them beside me. So these these are uh, the English original and the German translation of my first little book a novella, and then synchronicity. I have to admit that I think I should have chosen a different title for the German, but that's synchronicity um, is that's in German and then that's in English. They look almost identical. The English says the original story. So that's the difference. Um, and both of these stories try to capture what it's like for a young black German woman, a mother actually, um, or a black woman in Germany, I should say, who is having everyday experiences. Um, and it was like an attempt to write a story from a black female perspective um, where there's everyday themes. Like the first book, The Things I'm Thinking While Smiling Politely was about a marriage breakup. And the second book was looking at um, precarious living. So it's um, a graphic designer who's losing the ability to see color. So how is she going to be able to live? It's a bit of a oh. science fiction story as well, yeah. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And it's because of those books actually that I was able to start writing in German because somebody read the German translation of my first novella and recommended me for a competition. And then the story went on from there. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to be published in a big publishers without first having published in a small publishers. So the competition you're talking about is the uh, Ingenberg Bachmann Prize. Yes. <laughs> now, listen, you know, everything I've looked about this prize is it's a really important prize in Germany. You want to tell us a little bit about it? I can happily tell you something. For people who don't know this prize, I mean, there's nothing like it in the English speaking world. I haven't come across anything like it. It's a little bit like X Factor, but for literature. So you have a live televised event. It happens over the course of four days um, where there's a jury of seven people, uh, seven literature critics, and each of the literature critics brings along, invites two people to participate in the competition. Um, the, the rule is that the, the text has to be an original text, not published before, reads for about 25 minutes, and it's written in German. Um, the people who participate come from German-speaking countries, typically, so Switzerland or Germany or Austria. And then we have three days of live reading. So on the first day, five people read. There's a half an hour reading, a half an hour jury discussion. Um, on the second day, five people read. And on the third day, four people read. It's very intense. <laughs> the jury discussions can be quite harsh, a little bit like on X Factor. And it's then a on- reality show completely. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the Sunday, the last day, there's a kind of a voting of the who's the winner. Mm. There's, there's uh, three or four prizes. There's also a public prize. Yeah. And I participated in that in 2016. And you won that and then everything changed. <laughs> and then everything changed. <laughs> uh, I want to hear more about that. Well, what, we, what I want to do now um, is... Um, I know that there are people who are watching from the African side and there are people who are watching from the German side. And um, what I'd be interested in from you, Joyce, is um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Kenyan literary, literary scene? Um, I, I normally, like I, just a few days ago, I saw you asking to you know, recommend, you know, what are the new books coming out of Kenya? Um, mm -hmm. How is the theme? How is, um, you know, who are the stars in the past and who are the current stars? Yeah, okay. I'm not going to talk a lot about the stars in the past because they've received enough attention. Yes, um, <laughs> yes we all know. <laughs> there's a lot of exciting, there's a lot of exciting young writers. And this gives me a lot of joy as a critic because I know they are virtually working without structure. They create the structures half the time. So, for example, let's talk about um, journals like Down River Road. You know, this is just personal initiative, drive, passion for what you do, and saying, look, we, we, we don't know where the money is going to come from, but we're going to do this. So I love the burst of journals like that. They give me a lot of hope in um, how vibrant the scene is and how much, uh, I don't want to talk about resilience because resilience is always, you know, we, we praise people for resilience and in doing so, it allows us to continue neglecting them. So I really just want to use that word. 
what I really want to say is, it's amazing to see the ingenuity of people when the structures are weak. And by that I mean, look, mainstream media is not interested in Kenyan fiction writers. They're interested in the textbook market period. And at best, they will come to you and say, we want to front this book for standard six uh, readers. Um, it has to have the following themes. No writer wants to work like writing by committee is impossible. That is not fiction. That, 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 that is not you know, a wholesome piece of work. Mm. Um, so the mainstream writers and uh, the mainstream publishers, rather, for their own pressures, for reasons of their own pressures, uh, are interested in a different kind of setup. But here we have young creative writers. You know, not too long ago, I, I had a cup of tea. I know, actually, I had lunch with a young writer who surprised me because he said he doesn't even ever remember paying attention to literature as a subject in school or English. He just used to write his own little poems. Um, and then now he had moved to the point where he was writing um, short stories and getting published and getting recognized. And that's, I, you know, I, I love meeting people like that because it tells me that um, regardless of how the scene might be managed, there are people who will go on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so those journals, uh, I noticed though that there's a lot more short fiction being published, I guess because it's easier in terms of the platforms as blogs, as fiction, as, um, uh, as, as uh, sorry, as, 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 as collections for anthologies. Those are easier to put out than the novel, right? And so I, yeah. I see a lot of that happening uh, and I'm really grateful for those spaces. The other thing that strikes me about those spaces, if you want me to say a little about the past, is, um, you know, one of the things I notice when journals like uh, Down River Road come up or Lolwe is how much they are doing what was done before without necessarily having any knowledge of, of what was done before. I find that interesting because in many ways, they're using the same structures that were used by um, Zuka or Busara or Transition. They may not be in the academic space in the way Transition came out of Makerere, but they are people who find themselves in a city and they connect or in a country, they connect across space and time because they, have, they share a passion. Not too long ago, I was on a forum where Alexis Teyer, one of the exciting young writers, was saying that increasingly we need to have um, artist collectives where artists are working across genres, not just writers by themselves, but painters, for example, mm. sculptors, musicians. And what struck me about what she was saying is that it was identical to what Elimon Jao and the others were doing with Paya Pa Gallery in the 60s. Chemi Chemi, you know, Esekia Mfalele. This is the kind of thing that they had set up in Nairobi. The recognition that artists need um, to be together, to think together, um, if you like, to, to, to brainstorm, and that it produces the best kind of work. So it fascinates me when I see the younger group of writers doing what was done before without any knowledge of it or without caring to study it. They don't need to study it. I wish sometimes they knew about it because they might know some of the pitfalls. And so we see um, a new journal emerge and fall into the same hole that one that was around 20 years ago had fallen into. Uh, having said that, I do still believe in the power of iteration. I do still believe in the power of incremental gains. You know, very often we sit and mourn about, oh, Kwame died. Well, maybe it was supposed to die so that the next thing could grow. You know, thing, not, nobody lives forever. Why do we expect that institutions would? Um, you know, sometimes I take that organic approach because I really just don't want to keep mourning about you know, what is disappearing. What I also find exciting about Nairobi is that it continues to attract writers from many elsewheres. So not just people born in Kenya writing about Kenya, but people coming from many elsewhere, elsewheres um, and finding refuge in that space and finding things to say about that space. And that's also an exciting uh, thing to have. Um, the fact that Nairobi can be hospitable enough for a writer to find space to, to work is for me important. And and so it gives me a lot of joy when I see people like Zukis who are making Nairobi a home. Um, it tells me that we haven't lost that creative creative impulse. Um, do I wanna say more about those spaces? I mean, there have been some very exciting books. Uh, Shiko Kimeria. Uh, and incidentally, I see more women publishing than men. I'm not sure what that's about. Shiko it's Kimeria. An it's an Africa white thing. It's an Africa white thing, right? Um, even that when I look at the new novels about Uganda coming out of London, and we'll talk a little bit more about that identity thing. So whether you're talking about Hassan's We're All Birds of Uganda, 
or you're talking about Kololo Hill, uh, Nimashah's book. It's, it's an interesting thing. I see more women putting books out there. Uh, Makena Maganjo, um, who else was I reading the other day? Uh, Wanjiro Koinange. It's just, there just seems to be a lot more of that happening. So perhaps women have a secret they need to share with us. Sharon, you might, <laughs> might you know what that is? Why are, why are African female writers able to produce? Very uh, good question. Is it yeah. more or faster than the men? Let's think about that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Joyce. Um, so Sharon, it's on you now. Tell us a little bit about Germany and you mentioned <laughs> about your struggles, your struggles to get published. Listen, yeah. um, I've been doing this, I've been doing this, and the impression I normally get is that that it's a it's a really well developed uh, publishing scene. So you should be able to get published. So what's the story there? Well, I think. Um, up until the time around about five years ago when I won the prize, it wouldn't be unfair of me to say that the German language literature scene was very, very heavily dominated by middle class, white, um, actually, I would even say mostly men. Um, and the, the subjects and themes that were being published in fiction um, seemed to fit a certain taste um, the styles of writing, I would say. And it felt to me like, as an observer from the outside who didn't know how it, you know, how it came that the structure looked like this, it felt to me like that there weren't that many risks being taken. And I'm not sure if that's because, although the, the German publishing industry or the German language publishing scene is, is quite um, successful financially, I think, um, in the scheme of media, in the scheme of um, the growth of um, yeah, streaming, Netflix and, and co, um, and then different choices that people have to make in terms of where they get their entertainment from, reading was being, yeah, was coming down, was being reduced. So I think publishing was under pressure to stay relevant uh, and to stay viable. Then we entered a phase, like, when you had um, writers of color or, or African writers or black writers being published in Germany or German speaking countries, they were usually um, nonfiction <clears throat> or they were um, translations. Um, and then there was some kind, and they were often pigeonholed as migrant writers, yeah, if they were coming from German speaking countries themselves and were often pigeonholed as a specific type of literature, which didn't seem to flow very neatly into the wider literature space. It felt to me like the literature scene wasn't diverse and didn't really strive to be. That seems to have changed in recent years. I made an effort to put some of the pu recent publications up here. Um, and there are now emerging writers of color and black writers who I would say are yeah, taking the stage, like, for some of them, they've fought for a long time, they've been writing for a long time and have fought to try and get this kind of attention. And for some of them, um, there's been a kind of happy circumstance of, of opportunities coming together. So that, that means that they've been able to publish in, in, in the recent years. And it's a, it's a really exciting time, actually, because for example, my book has been published at a time when two other debut um, authors have also appeared, uh, authors of color. Um, I think they're both on my shelf as well. One of them is called Identity, and the other one is called Ministerium de Träume, as Ministry of Dreams. Um, and my book and these two books were spoken about a lot collectively. Um, Sometimes it was a bit of a, you know, these books are all from authors of color. It's good that we have these three authors of color. Are they taking over the German language in literature scene? But sometimes it was good because it meant that neither of us as authors had to cover the whole thing. You know, we were, about, we were able to be nuanced in our um, comments on <clears throat> culture, um, identity, politics, and that sort of thing. So I would say, it's still difficult for writers of color to break in, but now it seems to be a good time to be approaching agents and approaching publishing houses with a book project if you're a writer of color, I would say. 
Could you please tell me the names of the, the two other people that you, you know, the, the identity and... Yes, one moment. Let me just grab them so that they have their moment of... This is a book by um, an author called Hengeme Yakubi Farah. And this book is called Ministerium de Troima or Ministry of Dreams. And this book is called Identity. The author is called Mitu Sanyal. And our books all appeared this um, spring at the same time. There's another book that I'd like to um, mention in this, and that's this book called Drei Kameradinnen or Three Comrades by Shada Bazaar. This is uh, Shada's second book, and she's also an author of color. And we might want to talk about why the, I've mentioned <laughs> three non men, but um, Shada. Um, has also been discussed in this kind of, oh, this is a spring of authors of color and what's happening is the German literature scene about to be revolutionized. It is good that these books have appeared, but we're still talking about a handful of authors. Like, let's not get excited, yeah. What about journals? Are there any journals which, you know, we can see black writers? Because that's usually a good bridge for you to know, like journal than the than novel. Yeah, that's a good, question i'm i'm not at all um familiar with german speaking uh, journals and i don't know off the top of my head of any that that does that um which is not to say they don't exist it just hasn't come to my attention but what i can say is when my books were first published they were published in this small um, publishing uh, press that i told you about and it's the small publishing presses uh edison assemblage is one example or unrast is another example that have consistently published books by marginalized authors and made an effort to, to look for these. So that's not always been um, fiction writing, not always, but um, there has been quite a few fiction publications in very small. I'm, I'm looking mm. at another one um, here, this book, which I really love. This is um, a, a poetry collection. It's about 80 pages long. The author is Philip Kabukupsel. He's a German of, um, of South African background, and he's written this poetry collection. The reason why he's called it the act of, um, or the file of James Knopf. James Knopf is a, um, a children's literate figure. And it's like the, one of the only uh, black boys in German literature, right? James Knopf. And it's a little bit of a stereotypical uh, depiction. So it's not, actually a figure that black people are proud of and Philip has kind of used a humor to take this figure and then kind of reimagine him as a um, a character that's kind of um, rebelling against racism and stereotypical uh, depictions of black people in literature and it's a really it's a really nice book it's so interesting because Philip has been on this and has been on this live stream yeah? Oh, I really like Philip. I'm a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, SK, for your comment. But Black Urban Fiction Literature Sphere paints vivid like East African... Sub okay, I do not understand what that means. Maybe somebody... <laughs> I, I do. I, oh, well, what, what does it mean? I think it's just talking about how vibrant the scene is right now. I mean, I think about the number of you know, new young writers I've had the opportunity to sit and have a cup of tea with, people like Kiprop Kimtai, writing fascinating things, perhaps holding on to their manuscripts longer than they should because the mainstream publishers are letting them down and they're trying to find a way. Um, um, I think about people like uh, Kari Baraka, you know, absolutely fascinating in terms of not just what he writes, how he writes, but what his background is as a philosopher. Uh, as a student of philosophy, as a student of literature. Um, and so I think that that vivid thing he's talking about there, even when you look at the people who are writing what we might call non-literary fiction, pop mm. fiction, if you're interested in those categories, think of people like Okanga Oko, uh, writing, what was that, Businesswoman's uh, Fault, yeah? Um, Kisumu. I mean, you know, sitting down and just writing volumes and getting them published, how he'll sell them, he'll figure out later on, you know, they're selling books on m and WhatsApp and Twitter. I buy a lot of books off Twitter uh, from people like Colin Sakwa, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the campus exile. And I admire the initiative with which they put themselves out there on these social platforms and say, hey, listen, I have a book. Will you buy it? You know, and tell interesting also little stories and work as, as marketing and advertising. 
um, and between those two platforms, between um, in Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, perhaps Facebook on one side and, and WhatsApp on the other and Mpesa, they're collecting their money, however little it might be. And it's allowing them to believe in, you know, why this can work. So I yeah. have, um, you know, I, I like to think of that scene as really very, very vibrant and vivid. And to see it, you have to look away from the mainstream publishers. There will be the, you know, the few fortunate ones like Yvonne Award who break through internationally. But there are also all these others who are doing amazing things. Even when it's not the big books they're putting out there, it's the little stories that they tell. Uh, the mini microfiction, for example, on Twitter, whose handle is this that I like following because he writes about his estate WhatsApp group. And it's absolutely fantastic. Poshinsky. 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 Little acts of fiction are taking place everywhere. Um, and it just tells you that there is no limit to the imagination. Where the structures are not there, people make them. Yeah? Uh, and they put the work out there. Uh, Alvin yeah. Kavemba is, uh, is the writer I was talking about earlier who I had lunch with. And he surprised me when he told me literature was never something he paid attention to. But he's well on the way to finishing his first novel. And I'm excited for him. He's put out a few short stories. One of them, I think, won a prize not too long ago. And, and again, that just gives him the hope to, to keep going on. So the other thing that is happening, if you ask me to describe the scene in Kenya, is that we do have pockets of opportunity. You know, you saw what happened with um, Alliance Francais last week when they had the, the, the Nairobi Fest, the publication of John C. B. Okumu's collected plays. So those kind of little structures of support outside of the mainstream um, are really changing the scene. When you asked me earlier on to talk about the things I do, one of the things I did talk about because I haven't done as much of it as I'd like to lately is, is policy work, really influencing the people who set up the structures, how are they thinking about the arts? So for example, I was an expert on the UNESCO convention, the 2005 connection, a convention on the protection and, and promotion of um, cultural expression. Um, moments like that allow critics to key into the decisions that are being made. We don't always get heard at the Ministry of Culture, but we get invited. One day they'll hear us. One day. Yeah, One day. that's really good. I, I'd remember. like to just... Can I just add mm -hmm. something to what I really Thank like? Um, I'm very inspired actually by Joyce because of all the different, we have to work on many different levels at the same time. And I am very, very uh, happy and excited and um, joyful that you find the energy to do that. Mm. It's very Thank inspiring. You. I also try, um, I've been writing and what I did quite early on when I published my first novella, is I also tried to get other authors into publishing, in, into being published. So what I did was I started, um, what's it called, a book series. And at the time I, I wanted to focus on writing in English because that's my strength. I, I can speak German, but I knew that my skill level in German language wasn't good enough to be able to edit books. But I started a book series and it's called Witness. And I just hold up. We have six mm. books so far. Wow. I'm not very good at holding up my... <laughs> we have six <laughs> books so far. It'll be 10 years exactly. old next year. And this is the is latest one. Coming? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. The future of the this, movie. Yeah, this is a beautiful uh, poetry collection. Um, um, and it's just came out in, in June. And there's another one, there's another book planning to come out in October called In Audrey's Footsteps, um, edited by Professor uh, Heidi Lewis. And it's just a way of trying to get these themes, you know, because I keep on, whenever I can, I talk about diversity in German mm. language literature and I say we need more and there are more authors out there. We just have to keep on giving them the opportunities. And then I thought it's not enough to just say it. Um, it's also good for me to try to to bring them in on, on on projects where I can. So I just wanted to say thank you, Joyce, for all your work. Um, I'm inspired oh, by you. people like you. She, yeah, she's our dynamo, and we, we are grateful to have you in our space, Joyce. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank um, you, thank you. I, I love that both of you are actually in those spaces of looking at the material that's being published and being written. Mm -hmm. um, Sharon, what are people writing? I mean, in the, for instance, in those. Uh, in those publications that you held up, uh, what are the what are kind of the things that they're writing about? Um, who are the people that they are, are, are being inspired? Who are inspiring these people? Mm, that's a good question. I would say they're writing. I would say this: 
all writers, all uh, fiction writers in the end are exploring. They take a subject that's really important to them personally and they mm -hmm. dive deep. And it often has something to do with, uh, you know, finding out what the meaning of what the world is or the meaning of life or the meaning of the, something for themselves that's deeply important. I think all writers do that. But what happens, what tends to happen in Germany, uh, which is the context I know the best, is that if you're a writer of colour or a black writer, then it's pigeonholed as um, something to do with migration or something to do with, oh, they're talking about racism. And then it's only interesting for people who also experience racism. And I found that really frustrating because I think all of the writers have taken a subject and then they've really looked at it and, and tried to construct a story around, a plot around this exploration of a subject that's important to them. So for example, um, this book, Identity, is being discussed a lot at the moment. I'd like to just mention it um, because it's a book that's also the translation rights have been sold, I believe, into English. So that should be being available next year or the year after. And what that book does is it looks at um, discussions around identity politics in general. Like it takes its main character um, is an Indian, a, a, a German woman of Indian Polish descent. So she speaks a lot about what does it mean to be German, but not actually physically looking like a typical German. Um, and this person studies in university and is very interested in, in for example, post-colonial studies and meets a kind of guru figure. This guru figure, Sharasvati, is a, a professor from India, or so it seems. It finds out that um, we find out later that this Sharasvati is actually a white person who has pretended to be Indian and gone through their whole life or most of their life as an Indian person. And it's kind of uh, thinking about this identity discussion that was brought up by Rachel Dolazal. I don't know if you remember, there was a, a white woman right. who was passing as black for a long time. So what um, this author, Mitu Sanyal, has done is taken that and just discussed what does it mean when we use these labels? What does it mean when we say we're a person of color? What does it mean when mm -hmm. we say we're white? Um, it's been, people who read this book often say that their brains end up smoking, you know, because it's really, really intense discussions that go on. Very important discussions that happen. And I think, um, yeah, like I've, I've enjoyed thinking, you know, I, I often talk about this book with different people and also talk about things that I've written about in my own book and, and see where I agree with um, the premises of identity, where I maybe don't agree with its premises. But it's so good that there is something published in fiction that sparks or continues these discussions. It's so overdue, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, that's, that's really exciting, you know, the, the different... Uh, the different material being produced by this uh, personality. Joyce, uh, you're seeing there's a lot of stuff coming out. What are, What is being written? Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to hear what Sharon has just said because, um, and, and the question that you've asked just jumps on, allows me to jump on the back of that because what I find exciting about what's coming out of East Africa generally, um, and even Kenya in particular, is embracing for the first time the idea that to be a Kenyan or to be an East African is more than one thing. Let me explain that. I've always been a big advocate of urban culture. This is what all my academic research is about, is about saying what you call um, official or traditional or legitimate Kenyan identity, well, no. You don't have to have a tribe. You don't have to have been born in a village. You don't have... So what I love about uh, all of this stuff, because I was, I, was, I was putting out this stuff in 2003, and now so many years later, um, the fiction is actually resonating with what I've been saying all along, which is there is such a thing as a legitimate Kenyan urban heritage. You can own it. Um, I won't tell you about the problems I had when I first got an ID many, many years ago, and I said I was from Nairobi, and I was told nobody's from Nairobi. <laughs> We've come a long way. Even policymakers now, and my ID was changed, yes, finally, a couple of years ago, just four or five years ago. Uh, even policymakers now are beginning to reckon with this. So I see in the fiction, if you read the work of Alvin Katembe, his short stories, or you read um, Makena Maganjo's novel, South B's Finest, or you read um, Colin Sakwa, yeah? 
you look at uh, Gloria Moniga's um, children's stories, what they, they're setting stories, number one, in the city, without or in towns, without necessarily taking the approach that this is the headquarters of failure and death and suffering. Because that was always the image of urban Kenya. This is the graveyard of relationships. It is the graveyard of morals. It is a, so they're telling a slightly different story, a more nuanced story. And no, yeah. to tell that story, they don't need to reject the rural. They see the things interlinked. They see what one takes from one and what one takes from another and how it makes a move. So what I like about the complexity of the literature now emerging is the way that it embraces not identity, but identities in the plural. You can be more than one thing. And understanding that intersectionality that says a working woman is not an evil woman, you know, yes. which is the kind of thing that we had from the fiction and the popular songs and so on from the past. Very, very painful narratives for me because, and, and I tell you, those things do a lot of damage because as much as we were reading that fiction in the 70s, we we're also trying to raise children or to grow up ourselves in these spaces. What examples did we have? that were going to tell us we could be legitimate Kenyans. So the other ring that I saw in the fiction of the past is something I no longer sense. It's something I no longer feel. And, and I speak of it as an East African thing because if you read Jennifer Makumbi, um, her novels, her short, her short stories, if you read um, you know, Zaya Hassan's novel, We Are All Birds of Uganda, uh, Nima Shah's Kololo Hill, what they're doing is to say, what does it mean to be a diaspora Uganda? There is such a thing. And what are the histories interwoven into that identity? And as a Ugandan, when you move to other spaces in Europe, most of them are writing about living in London. One of them talks a little bit about being in Belgium. What does it mean? So, so I love the characters they create because they resonate with the kind of identities that really speak to a plural world, a world that is aware of more than one thing, a world that is aware that three things can be true at the same time. So I love the way a lot of this fiction is taking us away from the linearity and really pushing us to think more and more about the kind of dynamism that is created when people come together and they lose some of the suspicions or they learn to lose some of the suspicions about each other. These are yeah. interesting journeys for us to undertake. First of all, I'm really excited because I was also denied from having my ID being Nairobi. So I didn't know that you could change it. Now you can. You must. I'm going to <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and do that. There's a little I'm process happy. called swearing an affidavit and attaching your birth certificate, but you'll get there. Because your no, birth certificate, I'm... and that's the other thing. What benefit does the Kenya government have when it has all these documents with wrong information? Why would your birth certificate say you were born in Nairobi and your ID say something about the village that your ancestors came from? Who is this helping, having this wrong information? <laughs> so let's help them get their record straight. Uh, no, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, Sharon, I have to ask you about the individual Audrey Lodge. Um, yes. she, she, she seems to be a towering figure in the German, black German experience. Um, how has she, how has she influenced uh, the writing coming out of that part of the world? Can I grab one more book? <laughs> I'll just, bring them. actually, I'm actually. I'm actually <laughs> writing down notes because I'm really excited. I didn't know these things existed. Uh, I said one more, and then she grabs three. But let me let me just. I, I love this show and tell. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> These are the three books that I want to show next. So I, um, I'll begin with this book. This is um, a, a poetry collection by a woman called Maya Ayim, who's sadly no longer with us. But the reason that this book is important is because um, when Audrey Lord came to Germany the first time in the 1980s, early 1980s, Audrey Lord is a black mm. U.S. American. Um, activist, philosopher, everything, warrior, she called herself. Um, this is like a Joyce from the US. Yes. No, yes. I mean. <laughs> this is a nice description. <laughs> <laughs> so Audrey Lord um, was, uh, was teaching at the Freie Universität in Berlin and noticed that there were black women in the audience, but they didn't know each other. They were sitting one here, one there. And at the end of her lecture, she said, OK, I'd like to end this lecture by requesting that all the white people leave the room so that there's a space for the black people to get together, which was revolutionary at the time. She must have been accused of being a reverse racist and all the stuff that you get. In any case, these women spoke to each other and they were encouraged to stay in touch with each other. And Audrey Lord encouraged them to write their stories. That was really important because at the time we had 
black we had we've had black people in this area of the world for over 300 years like this is actually not new but what's what happens is our stories get you know repressed and hidden um so Audrey Lord was like look let's be in contact let's write our stories down speak to each other recognize each other and from this um encounter the new that what we call the, the second wave or the new wave of black german um the black german movement was born um one of the books that has been published relatively recently is this book called Eure Schweigen schützt euch nicht from Peggy Piescher. This is a quote. Eure Schweigen schützt euch nicht means your silence will not protect you. Audrey Lord said something like that, which is, and you can see this um, image of the people who've come together kind of ever since um, Audrey was in Berlin in the 1980s, there's been a regular meeting of black people in Germany um, every year for a long weekend, um, a, a youth hostel is booked out and then there are like parties and lectures and seminars and there's a children's program and this art program. And it's just a space where black people come together one weekend in a year and are not in the minority. They're not alone. They're not isolated. They're with a, a group of people and supporting each other. So it's, her legacy lives on. And this book is... Um, a, a translation it's just recently been published sister outsider has been was published a long time ago in, in the english original and has now been translated by um a black german woman called dr marion kraft um and is now available in german for i think the first time in a very big publishing house in any in, in any case so lots of people are now beginning to know audrey lord who hadn't had access to her work before. She, she seems like uh, she, she really changed the, the scene in there the, the, just by showing up. What? Yeah, she, she, she really like, she lived her beliefs, if you like. <laughs> you know, she had convictions and she followed through with them. So do you have a, a similar type of a personality or personalities right now in your space? One more time. Do you have similar personalities right now at the moment in your in the German literary scene that are black and you know at, at the same level? I definitely I think that one thing that's happening at the moment, which I think is a good development, is that there are definitely individuals who are like really extraordinary and doing excellent work. But it seems to me, or and it seems to me, that these individuals understand that the 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 movement is bigger than themselves, that they're not pushing for their name only to be out there in the open, but they're talking about a collective. So there's a collective, for example, Black Lives Matter in Germany. That's a collective of people. Certainly there are brilliant movers and shakers within that collective, but in public, they always present as, as a whole. There's this group that I mentioned right at the beginning, ADEFRA, which is the queer feminist organization. Um, there's some wonderful people, really. I could mention names, but I know that they always present themselves as a collective and, and they try to promote, yeah, community issues, community values. Um, uh, uh, Joyce, what about... Um, okay, oh, sorry, I'm hearing myself. Joyce... Uh, <laughs> Has there been uh, an influence from um, the other movements from outside? You know, like, you know, the Germans have Audrey Lord. How are the people who are writing right now, you know, in the new spaces that are emerging in East Africa, who are the big influences? Is it Black Lives Matter? Is it, who is it? That's a really fascinating question. Um, I'd have to think about it a little harder. But off the top of my head, um, you know, some of the conversations that have been going on, and, and sometimes we, we underestimate the effect of things, you know, the whole idea of um, decolonizing spaces, yeah, might have seemed um, a bit stale in Kenya, just because it happened so long ago, as far as literature is concerned, you know, the changing of the Department um, of English at the University of Nairobi in 1969 to the Department of Literature. It was a big bang then, and then we kind of just, you know, took it for granted. And so, for example, in secondary school, they now started teaching what they called oral literature or orature to say that mm. non-written forms are also uh, literary. And really saying this was not a tabula rasa before colonialism. People did have art forms. And I think because 
that shift happened so long ago, we began to take it for granted. I was fascinated two years ago um, when I happened to be giving a lecture in Cambridge, three years ago when I was giving a lecture in Cambridge. And one of the lectures actually had to be canceled because this whole decolonizing thing on the syllabus was so huge. There were protests. I was looking at them and thinking, mm, you're almost 50 years late, but it's okay. Have your moment. Um, but I see it. I see it in the way we write now. So when you look at what was written in the 70s, you realize that a lot of writers were still being very faithful to the medium, those writing in English, were being very faithful to the medium of, of, of English in terms of their syntax, in terms of their grammar and so on. When you read the younger writers now, they, they don't feel obliged to pay attention to the rules of English grammar in that way. They are code switching, they are using shang. They are, so they're really just carrying on that process of decolonizing many steps further. And so I think the influence of that has continued um, in ways that we sometimes don't even necessarily pay attention to in terms of where it started, but just seeing the kind of, you know, incremental changes that it has led to. Uh, so not just a change of name in the department, not just a change of name in the syllabus or a change of focus and methodology in the syllabus, but also the way writers actually write. And their continued acceptance in the mainstream as you know, um, doing credible uh, literary fiction. I, I think that's a big change. As to the question of whether there is a, a big kind of figure, um, you know, maybe some of the people writing in the way they are do not, would not even necessarily hold out to at all as somebody they look at. But I see many echoes of his approach to identity in a lot of the work that is coming out. I'm sure writers like. Um, Kari Baraka, who's himself a philosopher, have you know big towering figures that influence their work. I would have to read it with that in mind. I have to admit I haven't done so yet. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's really exciting. So we are we are we're going towards the end of the hour. This is moves so fast. Do yeah. you have any questions for one another? Do you have any questions for each other, by the way? Because uh, I don't want you to <laughs> to be sitting here and you have a question that you would have loved to to, to hear from each other. Let me go first, Sharon. Um I, I did want to ask you, but before I ask you a question, you showed me so many books, so let me show you one that you must read. Yes, read. thank you. Lovely. I'm in Manhattan and far away from my books. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll show you my bookshelf a little later on when we get off the screen. <laughs> in pictures. But I had wanted to ask you uh, about the process of translation. And, yeah. you know, when you write in one language, so I had two questions. One, do you do the translation yourself? But I think at some point you said your German wasn't that good. Um, or something to that effect. So one, do you do the translation yourself? But two, uh, when you review the translated work, you know what kind of conversations do you have with the editors, with the translators? What are the things that, as a writer, you nitpick about when a work is translated? I'm really curious about that. Yeah, and that's really a good question. I want to read both of those. <laughs> yeah. OK, first of all, I'm going to big, uh, what's the word, revelation, I don't translate. I, I once tried to translate something and it went wrong. I, I'm not very good at it. I, I'm, I've got the kind of brain that only functions in one language. <laughs> so I don't, I don't translate. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I think anyway. Like, I think also it's to do with the fact that I, I guess I consider the act of writing also in a way a translation already. Like I'm, I've got an idea and I try to put it down into words. And then to find new words again for the, that's too much work no. for me. Uh, <laughs> I wow. don't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and but when, um, when somebody else does it, what kind of conversation do you have with them? Yes. So I, I'm going to go through this process. I've had this process a few times. For the first two no, novellas, uh, the ones I showed at the beginning, um, my very, very good friend Miriam Nuning translated them. She's a wonderful translator. She's a black German herself. We spent many years in Washington, D.C. She studied in Howard University. So she was really immersed in the language and literature. And she also just really understood what I was trying to do with my with my work. Mm -hmm. So I'm super I'm, I, I don't think there would have been a better translator. I, oh, I'm going to say it like that. Then I I wrote a, a story, a short story in German, which won this prize that we spoke about, the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize. And this story, by chance, was translated by two different teams <laughs> into English. So there's a US American version. Ah, I've got it here. I'm good at this show and tell thing. Oh, I've got, I love it. Yeah. I love it. 
yeah. oh, there we go. So it's translated by Katie into British English and then into US American by Patrick Plosnitsky and Judith Mentzel. And it's great because this publication has put them together, has put yeah. the whole story. Yeah. Yeah, with illustrations, and you can compare yeah. the translations. So oh, wow. that was a lot of fun. And I yeah. enjoyed that a lot. I did. I, yeah. I still think that the story in its original is the story, right? The, uh -huh. the, thing, uh -huh. the thing I try to do with the language in German only works in German. But I think that the, the people who translated it found really, really good plan B solutions. <laughs> mm -hmm. For example, I don't know what the... Um, do you speak Kiswahili? Yes. How is it with, okay, so let me explain. In German, there's a way that you can address a person with the word you in a formal way or an mm. informal way. Mm. In English, we don't really have that distinction. And I was wondering mm. whether you, you have something similar in Kiswahili. Mm. In any case, in, in the, yes. you do. So in the German language, I was able to, to, to make a comment on the way a man was speaking to a woman. He kind of spoke down to her. And then when she spoke back, he was surprised that she was speaking at him at eye level. And I was able to do that with one word, yeah, in German. And yeah. in English, they had to find a workaround. They used first name basis or something like mm -hmm. this. So that, that was, that's, that's one reason why I don't want to translate myself because I find that too mm -hmm. hard. <laughs> and my new yeah. book, my, the one that's just been published this year, that will, be, that will be translated by a translator who's based in the United States. And we're in contact. And yeah, I think he's great. I think he'll do a really good job. We've, we've spoken, we've, he's done a sample translation and I really like what he's done. So I'm very relaxed about the process of being translated. Oh, okay. If, if I could just make a comment on translations. Um, yeah. You know, when, when we were working on, on um, and I'm gonna allow you to see a, a, a couple of these. When we were working on 10 cities, which I put yes. on the screen now, yeah? Yes. Yes. Oh my God. So, you know, um, wonderful, wonderful German publisher, uh, very, very committed to getting things done. But at yes. some point I was near tears because they kept coming back to us um, with some of the other writers who are doing Nairobi. That's Mokami Kuria and, and, and Bilo Didi. And they kept coming back to us to say, what's the translation for this? Well, actually, sometimes there's no translation. You just take the word as it is and, and, and figure it out in the context. But they wanted every single word. And, yes. and well, I realized how absolutely difficult translation is, number one. But number two, and you've now put it very well, um, the idea that when you tell the story, and here we were dealing with songs and song lyrics, when you, when you tell a story, it is a complete world. Like, it, 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 you know, um, in terms of the characters, the language and everything within it, you know, to then ask that it be broken down further by the person who created is to ask them to do something they can't. And I really think that that's a work of critics and translators. Um, yes. And I really appreciated that as, as, as we did the translations for 10 cities because it was so painful. Yes, yes. I'll just jump in here. The Hans Hofele is asking yeah. if there is still a lack of uh, translations on Af of African authors into German. Such a big nonfiction book market. Hmm. It, I think there's a lack there's a lack of representation of black people and people of color full stop. I think there can't be enough works published and I, I mm -hmm. hope I hope there'll be more. Um at the moment my what I know, my focus, let's say, is of black people who are living and working and loving in, in, in Germany and are not seeing their stories on the bookshelves. That's, that's, that's my focus. But um, I think German publishers tend to look at the success stories that have happened overseas. Something that's already won a literature prize or has already mm -hmm. sold a certain amount of copies. And then they take those works and they publish those into German. That's what I have observed. Mm. I, are you? Um, uh, we need to wrap this up now. Um, yeah. Are you, are you seeing this uh, in a, the medium and uh, long term? Are you, are you seeing the spaces for, uh, that you, that you're in in a very pessimistic or optimistic manner? Are you seeing you know a very good uh, uh, pickings in the space that you're in for for the writers that you're talking about, Sharon? Am I seeing it as pessimistic or optimistic? 
Yeah, I mean, um, are you seeing the future being very bright for this for the writers that you're talking about? You know, the Anya Sales and the Philip mm. Kabuko. Ah. Uh, I think what I, what my take on the situation is that these writers will publish anyway and it will be a, a privilege for the German, the big German publishing houses to pick up on them now. If they don't pick them up now, they'll still be still publishing, you know, they'll still find their way to get their voices out. So I guess the mo at the moment it's will the big German publishers really, they, I think they've started to realize that they need to do something and it's interesting for me to see if they will do it. I'm not sure if I'm optimistic about it. I think I'm just pragmatic. I can't really say whether it will happen or not. I just think the publications will happen. It's just a question of whether the industry will move with the times and take these voices on as well or not. Yeah. Uh, a new Joyce? I think I, I really, really believe that the Kenyan uh, literary scene will continue to be robust, will grow and we're gonna see more publications. I would love to do more work that allows writers to earn what they should because yes. I know how hard they work. And I'll give you an example very quickly uh, for why I'm so optimistic. Look at McKenna Maganjo. No training as a literary person, if you like. Never attended a single creative writing class. Put out her first novel uh, last year, just before the pandemic broke, South Beast Finest, self-published. She's finished her second book and it's incredible. It's called Everything Waits For You. And she's waiting, uh, she's looking for an agent and a publisher and so on. And she's 30,000 words into her third book. Wow. Look, this is in the space of three and a half years. So I'm giving that example to say writers are irrepressible. Yes. Um, the critics have a lot of work to do. It's difficult for us. I'll tell you this passion and habit and training I have. I walk into the bookshop and buy five books. It's really expensive. And, and I don't know how and when it pays me as a critic. But we can't stop doing what we do as critics because they won't stop writing. We have to go on talking about what they write. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, ladies. Um, uh, just um, do a bit of commenting here. Peter Child, really good conversation, quite information, informative mm -hmm. and engaging. No, ladies, you've been really great. I'm I'm so grateful. And uh, uh, Vicky Kamau, great discussion. Thank you, Vicky and uh, Child, for joining us. Um, so I'd like to say thank you, ladies. For is um, for where can we get the books that, that you published? The this books I yes. The where books, can I, where, where uh, can you get your work? I don't want to mention the name. If you're based in <laughs> if you're based in Germany or in a German speaking country, you can get them in any local bookstore. And I do think we should support the local bookstores. Mm -hmm. um, so. You can easily find my name via a search engine and then if you're in a german-speaking country it's very easy to get a hold of these books even mm. the ones that are published in english but for people who are not based inside germany there's this website begins with a <laughs> right say no more i'm not going to say more yeah and you joyce I will let the whole world know when Ten Cities becomes available in Nairobi, Johannesburg, Lagos, and, and everywhere else to buy, because it's an incredible book. And I'll tell you, from a publishing point of view, what those publishers achieved that was amazing, it's a huge book, as you saw, but it's so light. You can carry it in your handbag. And I love that about it. I love the thoughtfulness that went into the texture, the paper, the color, um, you know, all really great. So I will let you know as soon as Ten Cities come out, comes out, I'll let you know when I finally go away to Germany next year to sit for a year and write the book I've been thinking about for five years, whose name shall Where I be Where will mentioned. you be? I'll be in Berlin. Yes. Okay, good. We'll I will find up. you, Otto. I will find we'll you. We'll hook up. Uh, I, yeah. will. I will. Yeah. Good. Uh, you, you have each other's emails, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm yes. sure you can start the conversation. Um, okay, just one more comment here from uh, Mafex Inc. Great insights on the African literature in space. Thank you, Mafex. Um, and um, and also Hans I said, thank you all three and lots of success. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank and, you very um, much. And uh, for those of you who tuned in, thank you so much. We Please have a great evening. And uh, those who watch later, please have a great time too. Um, mm -hmm. I'll say goodbye now. Bye-bye.